what kind of emotional baggage do you have? You think about about the times you used to cry yourself to sleep at night when you were when you were a kid, or maybe listening to your parents argue, or maybe they got divorced, or maybe somebody died, or maybe your your rabbit died, or I mean, you know, we all go through these experiences, and then as you know, we get older, we have relationships that fall apart in junior high and things like that, and the emotions are so intense. And then we maybe go through a divorce ourselves, or we have a bad work situation, or I mean, you never know. There's all kinds of things that happen to us. When we're feeling those intense emotions, the energy of those emotions uh, can become trapped in the body. By removing that emotional baggage, it helps us to be able to uh, to feel happier and to be more present and uh, to live a life that's uh, not quite as difficult. Welcome to Letting Go and the Greatest Secret, where we explore the end of your suffering and the beginning of lasting happiness. I'm Hale Dwoskin, and today I'll be joined by Bradley Nelson. Dr. Bradley Nelson is a veteran holistic physician and one of the world's foremost experts on natural methods for achieving wellness. He is also the CEO of Discover Healing, author of The Emotion Code, and creator of the Body Code System. So how did you get involved in the work that you do? What, what led you to, to what you do now? Well, you know, it's, um, it's been a really, really interesting process for me. Uh, and it really started when I was seven years old. I, um, I had this incredible experience, really. I was really sick with the measles. And um, I'd overheard my parents talking about the plan for me. And I knew that the next day I was going into the hospital and I was going into something called an oxygen tent. Now, I didn't know what an oxygen tent was. I don't think I knew what well, I might've known what oxygen was, but the tent part of it sounded interesting, but I was really too sick to think about playing. I was really, really ill. So they made a bed for me on the couch upstairs um, in the living room so that I could be near their bedroom. And, uh, and I remember this night, like it happened yesterday. Uh, I'm lying there on the couch feeling really sick and uh, everyone else had gone to bed. And my parents came into the room and my mother said to my father, Honey, will you kneel down with me and will you say a prayer for our boy so that he'll be able to get well? And so they did. So they knelt down by the side of the couch. Now, my father wasn't, he wasn't a preacher or a pastor or anything like that. He was, he was, uh, he was in real estate and had been in construction for quite a while. And, uh, but anyway, he starts offering this prayer. And in the middle of this short, heartfelt prayer, something really miraculous happened. I had this change that started at the top of my head and it went whoosh, through my body to the soles of my feet about that fast. And I was instantly healed completely. Now, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't interrupt my dad. I waited till he was done, which didn't take long. Then when he was done, I said, I'm better. I'm better. I, I'm, I'm totally fine. I'm totally fine. And um, they said, that's fine, honey, go back to sleep. Tomorrow you're going into the oxygen tent. Um, but that, uh, that experience uh, was really so profound. I mean, to go from being really ill one moment to being completely well the next moment, mm -hmm. something that's so bizarre and so impossible, really, and so yes. incredible, you can't forget it. No, it so, sounds like an amazing experience. It was really amazing. And every moment of that experience is really just seared into every cell of my body. So that taught me that, uh, hey, apparently there's a higher power of some kind that we can draw upon and we can ask for help when we need it. And sometimes we might receive that help. So um, fast forward about another seven years, you know, things run in those seven year cycles. Oftentimes. Sometimes they and, do, yeah. Yeah. And I ended up getting, uh, uh, getting sick again, 
This time, what was happening is I was getting these terrific pains in the back. And um, they would come out of the blue and sometimes just actually knock me down to the ground or totally take my breath away. I mean, it was like it was like being it was like I was being run through with a sword or something. I mean, it was just terrifying, really. And um, my my folks, they were very worried about me, took me to the hospital and they ran these tests and uh, told my parents I had kidney disease. And that what I had was about 50% fatal, that my kidneys were, were in a state of uh, degeneration. They were kind of dying. And they didn't know if I'd survive or not. It was kind of a, a flip of a coin. Back then, they didn't do heart, or sorry, they didn't do, well, they didn't do any kind of transplants, let alone heart transplants. They didn't do kidney transplants back in those days. So if my kidneys died, then I, that was it for me. You can't live without kidneys. And so all of a sudden, my life was kind of uh, turned upside down. And, uh, and I could see the worry in my parents' eyes, and I knew um, this is really a serious thing. But there was nothing that they had to offer medically for me at all. There was no treatment for this. Uh, mm-hmm. So we were really on our own. Well, my mother was very, very interested uh, in natural forms of healing and alternatives to Western medicine. And so she ended up finding some um, holistic doctors back then. And there weren't very many back then, but there were some, and she found a couple and uh, we went out to see them and they, uh, they practiced out on the edge of town in a little trailer house in the middle of a wheat field. And I remember I'd have to scrape the mud off my shoes sometimes to get into their place if it rained. But I can also remember seeing busloads of people sometimes as we would pull up that would be leaving people would charter buses in other states. Now this is in Montana where I grew up and they would drive all, you know, hundreds of miles to see these people because they were powerful healers. So um, these people started working on me and my body started responding immediately. And I could feel the response in my body. I knew that what they were doing was what my body really needed. Apparently, the, the, the medical profession didn't really know everything there was to know because these people seemed to know something else. And uh, so within about three weeks, I was pretty much all the way better. Within about a month, I, my parents took me back to the clinic and uh, they ran the tests again. And as I recall, they ran the tests twice and said, oh, it's amazing. It's fine. It's a spontaneous remission. Whatever we did must have worked but you know, they hadn't done anything. I knew in my heart though, that what these other people had done had been exactly what I needed. So I decided at age 13 that I just, I wanted to be a chiropractor or some kind of a natural healer when I grew up. And uh, so then fast forward uh, uh, till I was, when I was about 20, I discovered computers and I became a computer programmer. And I loved computers and it was my life. And I was really a nerd. And, uh, and I started doing programming. Uh, I'd go into businesses and look at their processes and I would write software to, to help them program things, uh, to, help, to make things work. So I was about six months away from going into the, uh, the master's program in business at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And uh, my wife and I went home to Montana and we were sitting around with my mom and dad. And my dad said to me, are, are you sure that you don't want to go to chiropractic school and go into the healing arts? He said, you've always wanted to do that. And it seems like a great career. And I said, no, I'm going this other direction. I'm really into computers now. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going into business, get my MBA. I'll go to work for some big company like Exxon or IBM or something. And he said, well, why don't you think about it one more time? Oh, okay. Well, all right. This is the man, who, you know, uh, whose prayer had, you know, through whose prayer I had been healed miraculously. And I had tremendous respect for him. And, and uh, he was usually very, very wise. So my wife and I uh, made up a pro and con list of these two different pathways. You know, when you're young, sometimes you, you think you have things figured out in your life. And sometimes, you know, life throws you a curve. Even when you're old, that can happen. Yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> Life is full of those curveballs. Yes. Right. Oh, man. Life is what happens to you when you're on your way somewhere else. I right. remember reading a quote like that somewhere. 
So anyway, um, we made up this pro and con list and that didn't really help. And so that night, having learned at age seven, there's a higher power you can draw upon. I started thinking, boy, you know, I really don't know what to do now. I feel like I'm right in the middle of the fence. I thought I had it, my life figured out in the direction I was going to go. Now I've got this old dream of being a healer that's been brought back to me. I don't know what to do. So I figured, well, I can ask for help from that higher power. So I did. I got on my knees. I prayed. And I said, uh, Father, if there's a, uh, if there's, if you have anything to say about this, help me to know, because I, I'm okay to go either direction. And then I went to sleep. Well, so Hale, what happened was a few hours later, I woke up and uh, my mind was full. It was almost like I'd been having a dream, but I don't think I was having a dream. I just was awakened and my mind was full of all of these thoughts about how great it is to heal people naturally and how great it is to be of service to mankind and so on. And I would think, well, yeah, that's true. But, you know, computers, and I'd fall back asleep. So that happened three times that night. Same thing. I sleep for a while, wake up, have the same feeling. And uh, so the next day, I'm still really not convinced. I don't know what to do still. No clue. <laughs> and so on the second night, I'm on my knees again, praying and asking for guidance. You know, and we, and of course, everybody believes different things, but uh, I, I happen to believe that God is our father and that he is real and loves us. So once again, I'm on my knees praying. I'm saying, Father, help, help me to know what to do here because I, I'm not sure what to do. And if you have anything to say about this, help me to know. So on the second night, I had the same experience and it happened three times. But on the second night, it was different because each time that I was awakened, these feelings were geometrically or exponentially more powerful until on that third time that I was awakened on that second night, the feelings of um, thoughts of service to mankind and humanity and the whole world uh, was really just absolutely overwhelmingly powerful. I can't describe it. And right then I heard a voice that spoke to me very clearly, just like I'm speaking to you now. And it said, this is a sacred calling. And I thought, okay, that's the answer. And so, um, so I've thought about that a lot. Um, this is a sacred calling. So I went to chiropractic school and um, had a great time there and um, learned a lot. And then when I got into practice, um, I felt like God had or higher power had gotten me into this. And so uh, maybe I could get help. So I developed this habit. And uh, the habit was that I would, I would try to connect with that higher power, with God, source energy, universe, whatever, you know, we all refer to it as differently. And that's fine. I think, I think we're all talking about the same thing. Yes. Um, but I would try to make a connection with that higher power uh, because I felt like I needed all the help that I could get, frankly, yes. <laughs> right? Yes. And it, it was a totally private, totally personal habit. Nobody ever knew that I was asking for help from them from up above, but I was. But I'll tell you something, Hale. There were times during those years when a patient would come in to see me and I didn't know how to approach their problem, didn't know how to help them, didn't know what to do. And I would offer that silent prayer. And it was, nobody ever knew that I was saying a prayer. Yes. That I was trying to make a connection with the higher power, with infinity for them. It was just a momentary pause, really. I never told anybody, 20 years, I never told anybody I was you know, saying a prayer for them, but I was. But I'll tell you something, when these people would come in that had these bizarre, complex issues, I would offer that silent prayer. And sometimes in return, the response would be this download of information that would just pour into me, um, how to look at this and how to, how to perceive what's happening with them. And, and sometimes it would be ways to look at things that, that I had never even imagined sure. or that nobody else had imagined either. Sure. And sure. so, so that was really exciting. And so, um, one of the things that I found is that, um, all my patients had something in common and that was, uh, their emotional baggage. So what I found was that no matter how old or young a person was, no matter what they've been diagnosed with, whether it was something physical or mental or emotional, uh, there were emotional causes. There, there was emotional baggage that was a, an underlying cause, sometimes the only cause 
yes. of what was going on with them. And I found that by releasing that emotional baggage, physical pain would go away. Um, all kinds of things would improve. I mean, everything from inf infertility to digestive problems, to asthma, to depression, and anxiety, and phobias, and panic attacks, and PTSD, and eating disorders, and self-sabotage of all kinds. And it was really amazing because also I found that when people would come in to see me with some kind of a diagnosed disease, that there was always, 100% of the time, there was an emotional component mm -hmm. to their disease process. So eventually, um, I got the message from up above that I needed to sell everything that I owned and move somewhere else and write a book. And that's the emotion code that came out in uh, 2007. Uh, self-published as a soft cover book. And of course, now it's a hardcover book and it's available in many countries around the world. In fact, um, in fact, on the wall behind me, you can see some of, these are just some of the different versions of it. I didn't know what to do. They kept sending them to me and I thought, well, I might as well put these up on the wall. Right, right, um, right. Yeah, I, I, have, I have copies of my book from all over the world. It's kind of fun. It is fun. They look different, <laughs> different languages, different covers. Yeah. So that's kind of the nutshell story. Um, now what we do, we have a business called Discover Healing with a website at discoverhealing.com. And what we do is we, uh, we train people uh, how to do this healing work. And uh, we have online education programs where people can become certified practitioners of the emotion code uh, or the body code, which is a, um, the next level of um, uh, finding any kind of imbalance that's going on in the body besides just the emotional uh, mm -hmm. baggage. Sure. And we've certified um, be close to 9,000 people now in about 80 countries around the world. And uh, so I travel a lot and, and teach and uh, do lots of online things and uh, lots of uh, podcasts and things like this one. So that's how we get the word out uh, that um, there's, there's this new method of healing that anyone can learn and use. And it's uh, very powerful and very effective. So it's That's energy great. healing, fun no, stuff. A, no, it sounds wonderful. It sounds wonderful. And it's a fascinating way you got to all that, Brad. It's, it's just a wonderful story about when you, when you turn it over to higher power, which is another way of saying surrender or let go, yep. things open up. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that so true? You know, and so, so much of the time in our lives, we try to, um, I, I refer to it as being on, being on a plan of happiness. It's like, everybody's got their own plan of happiness. Yes. And a lot of them aren't going to work out very well. No. <laughs> if you're planning for happiness, you're postponing it for the future. So good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting thing, and um, you know, one of the things uh, that that uh, that I observed, I remember when I turned sixty. I'll be sixty five this year. When I turned sixty, one of the things that really stuck out to me, one of the things that I really noticed, was that um, looking back on my my own life, looking back on the lives of of the people that I've known in my life, um, I was able to really see from that vantage point. Uh, a little further up the mountain, you know, as far as age goes, how the decisions that I had made in my own life had played out in my life mm -hmm. and how the decisions that other people that I had known uh, had played out in their, in, in their own lives. And um, it's so fascinating, you know, in, uh, in quantum physics, there's this, uh, this principle uh, that's called the collapsing of the wave function. And, um, and essentially, Essentially, what it means is, uh, in, in practical reality, uh, you know, when you wake up in the morning, uh, you're faced with some choices. You can either roll over and go back to sleep, uh, or you can uh, you can get up and get out of bed. Uh, and you know, you've got a few different choices. Well, when you make a choice, all of those possibilities, which up until that moment were open before you. Um, suddenly collapse into that one choice. And so, uh, so what we do in our lives is we are continually faced with all of these diverging possibilities and all these diverging futures. And 
when we make a choice, uh, all those other diverging potentialities uh, collapse into that choice that we've made. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, you get to the end of your life and your life is really the, the sum total of all of those little decisions that you've made along the way. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, what's fascinating about the, the work that we do uh, is that um, it's all really based on quantum physics and that's how we interpret things and how we understand things. And um, when we work with someone at a distance, essentially what we're doing is uh, we're taking a, a current reality of theirs and we're collapsing uh, that into a new, better reality on a quantum level. And uh, it's fascinating, you know, as you start to, as you start to remove the emotional baggage that you've picked up in your life, uh, you get to a certain point and uh, it's almost like stepping out of the old skin that you've been walking around in or the old suit that you've been wearing uh, into this new reality uh, that feels much cleaner and much lighter and uh, much brighter than the old one. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, we all want to ascend, right? And what, what keeps us bound to the earth in a sense is, uh, is our emotional baggage. But it's not only our own emotional baggage from our own lifetime, it also uh, is emotional baggage that we've inherited from our ancestors that we pick up at conception from mom or dad. And sometimes these can go back for 10 or 20 generations. Um, and that's another aspect of this that's really interesting. Uh, also stuff that we pick up when we're in the womb, things that happen to us when we're babies. Uh, I remember once um, I was speaking at a workshop and there was a, uh, there was a young woman, I asked for a volunteer and a young woman came up out of the audience. She was about, uh, about 21 years old. And, um, I asked her if she had any issues that she uh, was aware of. And she said, no, and no, no problems really. So I started doing some testing and uh, to get answers from the subconscious mind, which is where all the information is, we use muscle testing of different mm -hmm. forms. So I was having her hold out her arm and I'm asking questions. And I quickly found that she had a trapped emotion. And um, we use a chart that looks like this to identify the emotions. There are 60 emotions on the chart. It's divided up into two columns and six rows. And so very quickly, I was, uh, I was able to identify the emotion. The emotion was forlorn. And forlorn is kind of feeling all alone and hopeless and desolate and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I asked some more questions. When did this happen to you? When did this emotion become trapped in your body? And uh, it went back to about the first year of her life. And I thought to myself, well, I'm sure she's not going to remember anything. And I asked her if she had any idea what it was about. And she said, no. Now, at the beginning of this event, um, I, I was greeting people as they were coming in the door. And I had happened to meet this young woman and her, she came with her mother. And so I thought, well, um, I wonder if her mom knows. And I looked out of the audience and there's her mom. And she's as white as a sheet. And she's got her hands like this. And I said, hey, do you have any idea what this might have been about? And she was really kind of mortified, but she said that she thought she might know. She said that what happened was um, during those years, she used to use cloth diapers. And one day she accidentally pinned her daughter with a safety pin. She accidentally pinned her daughter to her diaper. So that safety pin went through her, some of her daughter's flesh and, uh, and she didn't know about it until she changed her the next time. So probably for several hours, this poor baby is just in agony. And I'm sure she was crying and her mom must have been really overwhelmed to not find it out sooner. But when she did find it out, she was just horrified. And she had never told her daughter that. And so her daughter's finding that out for the very first time right there in front of everybody. Right. And so, so anyway, um, I released the trapped emotion from her, which just takes a few seconds, just swiping down the, the governing meridian, which runs down the back a few times. And uh, she went back out to the audience and sat down and I continued my workshop. About 10 days later, I get an email from this, uh, this young girl's mother. And she said, listen, she said, my daughter has had this problem since she was about nine years old or so with her gait. Um, and or not her gay, but with pain in her knee and in her hip. 
and it's gradually been getting worse and she just lives with it. And it's, it's been affecting, it's starting to affect the way that she walks or her gait. So we've taken her to different people. Nobody's been able to figure this out, but she said, the moment you release that trapped emotion of forlorn from her, from being pinned to her diaper, um, that pain in her hip and in her knee has just been completely gone and she's walking totally fine. And she said, not only that, she's feeling this new lightness of being that she hasn't felt before. And she's telling everybody about this. And she said, as her mother, I wanted to wait to see if this was just some kind of a fluky thing. But she said, sure. after 10 days, she said, it's not coming back. She said, so I wanted to let you know. Um, so, you know, you think about that and you know, what kind of emotional baggage do you have? You think about, about the times you used to cry yourself to sleep at night when you were when you were a kid or maybe listening to your parents argue, or maybe they got divorced, or maybe somebody died, or maybe your, your rabbit died, or, I mean, you know, we all go through these experiences. And then as, you know, we get older, we have relationships that fall apart in junior high and things like that. And the emotions are so intense. And then we maybe go through a divorce ourselves, or we have a bad work situation, or, I mean, you never know, there's all kinds of things that happen to us. When we're feeling those intense emotions, the energy of those emotions uh, can become trapped in the body. And so that's what the emotion code is about. It's just about finding and removing that emotional baggage. And uh, well, by removing that emotional baggage, it helps us to be able to, uh, to feel happier and to be more present and uh, to live a life that's uh, not quite as difficult. Well, I, I totally understand what you're, you're talking about because the, the work that we do has been helping people release emotional baggage since the mid, early 70s. And we don't do it with the meridians, although you can feel the energy shift in the meridians, but we help people just get in touch with their natural ability to let go and through some simple processes they do themselves. And, and the, the results that you're noticing are very similar to the things that we've noticed. So well, I to totally awesome. get what you're talking about. Totally. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more. You, I think you, there are things that you can give people they can start doing on their own. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, you know, um, first of all, one of the things that we teach people is, um, is how to find and remove the emotional baggage from whenever it might have, uh, from whenever it might have occurred, yes. or even if you received it at conception, things like that. The subconscious mind remembers and knows all of uh, all of that. It knows all about all the emotional baggage that a person has. Sure. And so, if you inherited a trapped emotion from your tenth great grandfather, was thrown into the poorhouse, and now that's why you're having trouble with money, <laughs> you can find that with the emotion code. Mm -hmm. um, or, uh, you know, if your grandparents went through some kind of, maybe they were in the pogroms or something, or they went yes. through the Holocaust. You know, there's a book written recently about the uh, grandchildren of people who uh, survived the Holocaust mm -hmm. and how their DNA is a little different and how the, the, the blood markers um, for aging are greatly accelerated and how their, uh, uh, their immune systems are much more... Um, well, they're more fragile, I would say. And so, um, and they can only attribute that to what their grandparents went through in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So you can find things like that. Um, you know, it's really, um, it's really interesting. There's one more story I want to share. And um, there was a sure. woman that came in to see me. She was about 72 years old. And uh, after talking with her and so on, we I started working with her and found that she had... Um, she had a trapped emotion of uh, sadness. And uh, in tracing it back, it went back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. It went back to 1963. Uh, and so I did a little more testing. Uh, was it November 1963? Yes. Okay. So then I asked, well, was it about you know, the, the assassination of John F. Kennedy? And the answer was yes. Well, when we arrived at that, all of a sudden, she breaks down weeping and tells me that Yes, that affected her so deeply. And then when JFK Jr. died in the plane crash, uh, it was like it all came back all over again. And, and all she could do was cry. She wasn't able to work for days. She had a job, but all she could do, she was just deep, deeply yes. in mourning. And I thought, gee, that's interesting. 
Um, Cause I know everybody was sad about JFK's juniors plane crash, but there weren't too many people outside of the immediate family who couldn't even work because they were in such a deep state of grief. Sure. And I thought, well, that's a great example of what a trapped emotional energy can do to you. She developed this trapped emotion about JFK in November of 1963. And then when another JFK died, it was like, boom, we all got reactivated. Sure. Right. So anyway, um, I thought, to myself, gee, I wonder where this has been all these years because a trapped emotion is like a ball. It's a little ball of energy from about the size of a baseball to maybe about the size of a small melon. And I, I thought, gee, I wonder where this has been all these years and what it's done to her body. Because when you have a trapped emotion, it will tend to distort the normal energy field yes. of the body wherever yes, it's yes. lodged, right? And so, uh, so I tested her and I asked, well, was this on, on the right side of your body, no, it was on the left side, yes, in the abdomen, no, in the chest areas. Turned out that that, was, uh, that energy was lodged right in the area of the left breast. And then all of a sudden, she and I looked at each other because that breast had been removed about four years before. And so, um, so there's a case where I really, I believe that was, that was the single biggest underlying factor that resulted in the cancer for her. And we see these, uh, these metaphysical connections sometimes when we find emotional baggage and sure. where that emotional baggage goes, right? Um, if it's about a relationship, the energy will often go. If you're a female into the breasts, uh, if you feel like you're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders, it might lodge in your neck or in your shoulders and so on. Yes. And so, um, you know, if you can't stomach what's going on in your life, it may lodge in your stomach, things like that. Sure. sure. Kind of interesting, <laughs> right? Yeah, it is. So, uh, so is there something you can, uh, I know uh, you te you train people yes. how to do this with other people, yeah. but is there something you can share with the audience that they can start doing immediately to help? Yeah, them? absolutely. So, um, so one of the simplest ways to tap into the subconscious mind is through a method that we call the sway test. Now, um, here's how this works. If you think about plants, a plant, if left near a window in a pot and you give it water periodically, but you don't move the pot, what will happen is the plant will end up growing towards the light coming in from the window. We all know that. Yes. They've done studies with plants though, and they found that uh, uh, if a plant is in a room with uniform lighting all around, normally the plant will grow straight up. But if you put a speaker in the room that's playing beautiful soothing music and lullabies, the plant will grow towards the speaker. On the other hand, if you put a, a, a speaker in that same room and you're playing harsh grating sounds and certain kinds of really intense music, like screamo, I guess, um, <laughs> the plant will actually bend away from the sound coming out of the speaker. And the roots themselves will even bend away, trying to get away from that sound. Really interesting. Yeah. Well, the human body has this ability built right into it. And so, uh, so if you're standing, for example, uh, and you're very relaxed and you're holding certain thoughts, if you're holding thoughts of positivity, for example, your body will tend to Within a few seconds, it will tend to sway forward. If you're holding thoughts of negativity, the body will tend to sway backward. And that's your subconscious mind trying to communicate to you. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is um, we can actually walk you through this. So uh, um, <clears throat> so if, if you're watching and listening, what you can do is you can, you can stand up. Now, if you can't stand up, you can uh, sit right on the edge of your chair. And that also works. But standing up works better. So if you stand up, uh, you can just drop your hands to your side. Uh, you can close your eyes, take a breath, let it out, and, um, and just stand there very, very relaxed. Now, what you'll notice is as you're standing there very relaxed, um, there's a little bit of movement going on. Um, it's impossible to stand absolutely perfectly still. Even if you go to Buckingham Palace and you see those guards, they can't stand perfectly still, although they do a pretty good job at trying to. So there's a little bit of movement going on, and that's just your postural muscles that are continually working to keep you from falling over. Yeah. So you might notice a little bit of a movement to the right or left, or maybe a little bit to the you know, one corner or the other, and that's fine. But now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about something negative, okay? Um, uh, if you can't think of anything negative, I'll give you an idea. You can think about the word war. Uh, there's a war that just started, uh, you know, in, uh, in 
the Ukraine and so on. And there are wars going on all over the world right now. And there have been uh, for a long, long time, right. <laughs> probably since about day one uh, on this planet. I happen to think that this is kind of a unique planet, uh, maybe the only planet in the universe where war happens. This is, this is a very warlike planet. But for a moment, what I want you to do is you're standing there, I'd like you to think about the word war and try to imagine what really goes on in war. What are people doing to other people? What's really happening? Imagine, if, imagine having to describe uh, what goes on uh, in a war to someone from another planet that uh, doesn't know what war means. What are we really doing? What's really happening? What are people doing to other people? What's happening to villages and cities and what's happening to families? And think of all the tears that have been shed in this world from day one um, over all the wars that have been fought. Yeah, that's so, a lot. <laughs> that's a lot, right? Yeah. So as you're thinking about that and as you're standing there very relaxed or sitting on the edge of your chair, what you'll probably notice is that uh, after holding that thought and holding that focus for a few moments, your subconscious mind will suddenly start to move you away from that thought. In other words, you'll start to sway backward away from that sheer negativity of that thought of war. It's a terrible thing that goes on on this planet. Now, let's shift gears now. And what I'd like you to do is, once again, just clear your mind, relax, take a breath, let it out. And as you're standing there very relaxed, I'd like you to think about something else. I'd like you to think about unconditional love. And I'd like you to imagine that you're living in the future. Imagine that a thousand years have gone by and that you're still alive, but you're, you're a much different person than you used to be. Uh, for one thing, you are surrounded now in this field of unconditional love. Um, everything, everybody uh, has perfect unconditional love for you, the higher powers love for you fills every particle of your body. Well, imagine what that would feel like. But beyond that, imagine that you over these last thousand years have really changed a lot and you have become capable of unconditional love yourself. So that the unconditional love that fills your heart for all of creation, is so huge that your heart can't even contain that love. And that love expands out from your heart and goes out and it fills the solar system and it goes out into the far reaches of the universe. Imagine for a moment what it would be like to be a person at that level. Now, when your subconscious mind connects with this thought, uh, your body, is going to be moving forward. And a lot of you right now I know are on your tiptoes because this is a potential future for you and your deep subconscious mind knows that. And so it wants to move you towards that potential future. And uh, it's letting you know, yes, this is good. This is light. This is possible. And so um, this is how we can do, uh, how we can get information from the subconscious mind. So now what you might want to do is uh, once again, just return to a normal kind of a neutral posture there. And uh, as you're standing there, totally relaxed or sitting on the edge of your chair, again, just take a breath, let it out and relax. Now I'd like you to pose a, a question to your subconscious mind. Ask this question, uh, do I have a trapped emotion? Do I have a trapped emotion? Or in other words, do I have emotional baggage that is, uh, affecting me? Do I have a trapped emotion? Now your body will probably, if you hold that thought for a few seconds, it takes about usually three to 10 seconds for the subconscious mind to respond. If you sway forward, that's a yes answer. If you sway backward, that's a no answer. Now, if you sway backward on that one, then I need to give you a different one. And this question uh, and even though you might not have any idea what I'm talking about, your subconscious mind does, it will know. So ask this question, do I have a heart wall? Do I have a heart wall? Just let that question sit there for your subconscious mind for a moment. 
Do I have a heart wall? And as you focus on that, you may get a forward sway for yes. You may get a backward sway for no. Uh, about nine out of 10 people will sway forward on that one. And, uh, and that brings me to that subject. So, um, so let me explain a little bit about this. And if you're standing, you can go ahead and, and sit down or do whatever, you're, uh, whatever you want to do now, and we'll continue. Um, this is really fascinating. Um, back in the 1960s, when doctors started doing heart transplants, it didn't take too long before certain pa patients would come back and they would say, you know, there's something strange going on because I used to hate Mexican food, never cared about it. Now I love it. Or I never cared for baseball. Now I'm at every game. Or they'd say, I have memories of being in places that I never in my life have ever visited. How is that possible? Or sometimes they would say, my handwriting has totally changed. I don't, I don't understand. Am I losing my mind? And in every case, when these patients were connected with the families of the heart donor, they would find, um, oh, yes, that's our son's handwriting that you have now. How bizarre. Or they'd say, well, yes, our daughter visited Rome many times and loved it. And now you say that you have memories of being in Rome, but you have never, ever visited Rome. Could those be her memories? How bizarre. Um, and so there are books written about this. It's called Cellular Memory, of course. And uh, the ancient peoples believed that the heart was the seat of the soul and the source of love and creativity and romance. And uh, even today, if you're lucky, on Valentine's Day, somebody might give you uh, a box of chocolates in the shape of a heart, right? And um, so these ideas about the heart being all of these things go back since time out of mind. I mean, in the Bible, for example, the word heart is mentioned just shy of a thousand times. And um, the ancient Egyptians believed that when you die, you go through a ceremony on the, on the other side where your heart is actually weighed. Um to find out what kind of a person you were. So these ideas about the heart go back since time out of mind. Well, what we now know uh, is that uh, the heart is actually a second brain and that um, the brain that is in our heads um, is actually obeying the messages sent by the brain that is yes. in our hearts, yes, right? Yes. And so uh, what happens is when you feel like that heart is being broken, if someone is really hurting you or you're feeling really deeply grieved, uh, you can feel a physical sensation in the heart. And um, when that's going on, your heart is really under assault. And the subconscious mind will then, in response to try to protect the heart, will we'll put up a wall made of layers of your emotional baggage. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one of the things that you can do, uh, let me get, getting back to the sway test really quickly, you can find an emotion code chart. Uh, you can find these online. And um, of course, the total explanation of how to do it is in the book, The Emotion Code, which is available everywhere. But um, you can actually test yourself with the sway test to see if you have a trapped emotion. And, uh, and there are videos online that can show you how to do this. Just, you know, you can YouTube it. But uh, this issue with the heart is fascinating because we find that about nine out of 10 people have put up this wall around their heart. And one of the things that we have found is that that wall that's around the heart for so for nine out of 10 people is a block to, uh, or it's in the way of them being able to really feel uh, joy and connectedness with other people. Mm -hmm. And that wall is taken down. People, have, uh, uh, people often fall in love who never thought they would, even at advanced ages. Uh, when that wall is taken down, people have creative ideas that start to flow spontaneously. When the wall is taken down, um, people often report that they can feel the love of the higher power for them. And so, um, so what we find is that it's, it's really critically important to take down that wall or have someone help you take it down. Sure. Uh, you can do it yourself too. All the instructions are in the book. The book is basically a book of instructions and stories and explanations of how, how to do this really simple process. And kids can do it, so it's easy. Cool. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Bradley Nelson. You can learn more about Bradley and receive a free Emotion Code starter kit at emotioncodegift.com. That's emotioncodegift.com. 
If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you have immediate access to future episodes. Please give us a five-star rating and share it with the people you care about. If you'd like to learn more about my work, my mentor, Lester Levinson's work, and the Sedona Method, please visit www.sedona.com. As you explore our site, you learn the key to lasting happiness, success, peace, and emotional well-being. We have books, courses, events, and plenty of free material to explore. Again, go to Sedona.com. That's S-E-D-O-N-A dot com. Thank you for being here, and we'll catch you in the next episode of Letting Go and the Greatest Secret.